Hey everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, and presented by Trainer Road, the only podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. Uh, as you can see, I'm with Nate Pearson here. Hello. Our CEO, and not our head coach, Chad Zimmerman, but we have a special guest with us, Jeff Linder, also known as NorCal Cycling on YouTube. Hello. How you doing, man? I'm good. Good to finally make it. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Uh, so if anybody doesn't know, they should check out Jeff's channel. Uh, it's awesome. It's got basically a, the race analysis, the similar stuff to like w what we do. Jeff does it as well. Uh, the main difference is uh, Nate and I, when we do our videos, we like scrap for maybe a win in a Cat 3 race while Jeff is actually winning Cat P1-2 races. So On occasion. <laughs> and when you say kind of similar, uh, we're inspired by Jeff. Jeff's been doing these videos and uh, I was watching them. He's like, hey, we need to do the same thing. So we actually copied Jeff. The only difference we is we had to do another angle of teaching stuff because uh we don't win like you do but we've i learned so much and so what we want to do here is talk to you all about sprinting and see uh to kind of teach our audience all the things about how to be a good sprinter because really i think that's a huge part of winning races is that yeah, right definitely yeah um i mean uh well first of all if you're not a sprinter <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. pretend like you're a sprinter and don't wait for the sprint that was that was the biggest thing when i was coming up um cat five, cat four, cat three is like, everyone seems like everyone thinks that they're a sprinter. Oh yeah. Everyone in, in lower categories, everyone does. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah. like, I thought I was a climber, so like it goes both ways Yeah. <laughs> where I would, um, maybe not, not uh, do what I was supposed to do to win a race and try to go hard on a climb and then just get passed over the top or something. But if you're not a sprinter, don't let sprinters win the race and be there at the very end. Yeah. Um, so if there's a climb, go hard on the climb. If you see they're out of the position, then uh, capitalize on that. If there's yeah. a crosswind, something like that. How'd you figure out that you, like you said, you thought you were a climber. Yeah. Uh, first, tell us why you were a climber and then how you realized that you were a better sprinter perhaps than you were a climber. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so, like early on, you don't really know what you're good at. <laughs> right. You just, whatever you like watching more on TV, you're like, that's me. <laughs> like, yeah, that's like, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Oh, I like Mark Cavendish, I must be a sprinter. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, you know, I went out and I did some, some uh, early, uh, they're called early bird races. They're, um, cat five races uh -huh. and, um, they give you the fundamentals on, on how to race your bike. And, um, and then I just went and registered for category five races. And, uh, and I guess, you know, the, the first time I thought maybe I, I had a good sprint is because, um, I was in the right position kind of by accident towards yeah. the front of a, of a cat five race. Yeah. And, um, and I thought I was a climber too, because I accidentally found myself in good position at the bottom of a climb. Yeah. But you, I didn't realize at the time that, that, um, you know, your position has so much more to do with, with your success as a sprinter or a climber. So, yeah. um, so I think, uh, when, by the time I was a cat three, cause I had catted up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, having just uh, decent fitness, I came from running. Yeah. Um, never was very competitive as a runner, but I came from running, had some decent fitness and, um, you can make a lot of mistakes early on, Yeah. but you don't, you don't really start to see that segregation between, you know, who's a climber, who has a good time trial until I'd say like category three range. That's when you really start to see the segregation between yeah. riding I, styles. I think it's because too, if your fitness is higher than the cat five and cat four people, you're just automatically better than everyone. So yeah, you seem everything. like this all rounder. Yeah. Um, yeah. that can just win anything. But then when it gets more competitive, the same with Pete Morris, he thought he was a sprinter. Then when he got in the P one two, he's like, Whoa, I'm not a sprinter. Yeah. yeah. So is this to tell what your strength is? Would that be just, just in racing, seeing like trying everything and seeing where you get dropped and where you do where you're successful? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this was before, I mean, I, I wasn't a late adopter for a lot of the technologies too. So like power meter, I didn't have that until recently. Yeah. So I guess like nowadays you, you might have a better idea just based on a test if you go out and test yourself. Yeah. But that's just the fitness side of things. We could talk a lot more um, about strategy too. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, just knowing where your physiological um, benefits lie uh, is go out there and race and, um, and try everything. I think that's, that's a good suggestion. Did you have like a crushing moment when you were like, oh man, I'm actually not the climber <laughs> I thought I was? Yeah. Uh, uh, what was the road race? They hasn't been around for five years. It's up in Northern California near, near Zamora. Um, okay. Anyway, I, it has yeah. this, it has this climb on it. And yeah. at the time I was like cap, cap four, I think maybe yeah. it was, maybe it was three. And I thought, um, like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go hard over this climb, you know? Yeah. And, um, I just ended up, um, hitting this headwind climb and dragging basically the whole field behind me. And I was like at my limit thinking, I'm just going to ride away into the sunset and this is going to be my, my glorious <laughs> yeah. moment because I'm the best climber, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then everyone just came around me at the top and, uh, 
And I, I basically just got dropped. I couldn't even hang on to the Peloton at that point. I was just completely cracked. <laughs> and I was like, I am not a climber from, from this yeah. moment forward. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like you said, I think that you have to be, you have to do enough hard rides or races where you get brought absolutely to your limits and tested. Like if you're not tested, it's really hard to tell what you are truly good at or truly bad at. Um, the other thing to note is it's your, what you're usually truly good at too is what you've kind of been doing recently. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. I know a lot of people who do a lot of group rides and they sprint all the time and they're a better sprinter. Um, and if you, so if you've never sprinted before at all in training yeah. uh, and you, you go to race, you're not good at sprinting, like don't expect it. Yeah. Um, we can get into sprint mechanics yeah. in a little bit, but you, these things are trainable. So you're not yeah. stuck in pigeonholed forever. But I think uh, in general, our physiologies do have uh, like your, your weighted one for the other, but you really can't find that too until you fully explore it through training. Agreed. Definitely. Yeah. Now within sprinters, there's, or within sprinting, there's also different types of sprinters. And that's something that I think a lot of people perhaps don't realize at first, but there are people that are good with, you know, a very short sprint, like what we have here at Sea Otter, which is where we're at, by the way, uh, a really short sprint. This is like basically a hundred meter sprint that you, that you have, or there's some people that are better at longer sprints. Some people are good at high speed kind of flat slight, you know, downhill sprints, a ton of different ones. What are you best at? And I guess once again, that's probably just come to the, you know, the cream has risen to the top through yeah. the competition, but what are you best at? Um, not short sprints, um, but not those like terribly long 400 meter sprints either. Yeah. But, um, you know, like the bump circuit race, if there's like a, if there's a ramp. Yeah. So the bump circuit race is this, um, it's a circuit race in Livermore and we do several laps, but the finishing like 75 meters or something is up this. Um, what do you guys think? Like 10% ramp maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Something it's, like that. It's, I haven't it's, done it's it. really, it's, it's really steep. It's steep. Um, but, but you can, you can just unload your sprint. So like I'm, I'm lighter than most sprint than most sprinters, heavier than most climbers. I'm in this yeah. kind of weird spot. So if there's a ramp, I'm usually pretty good. Yeah. Um, at a ramp like that. And, um, maybe 15 seconds yeah. is where I'm best. But you see guys like, um, like Justin, Justin Polson, Semper Poro, He's got acceleration like you wouldn't believe. So coming out of a corner with 100 meters to go, I would not want to face him because he weighs um, 135 pounds maybe. Right, yeah. <laughs> and he has crazy power. So yeah. he has acceleration. Like he just can't be beat within, you know. A short distance. 100 meter yeah, corner, something like that. You're in a lot of trouble if he's on your wheel. So what do you do, Jeff, if you come in to, uh, if there's an end of the race and there's an end return like at Sea Otter and 100 meters to go, which yeah. is I timed the Cat 3 race, it was eight seconds. Mm hmm how do you counter someone if you're racing against someone who has that really explosive sprint? Oh, um, well, in most cases, I, I can't speak um, to this race in particular, but let's talk maybe like red kite, something similar where sure. you come into a corner, and this is true with so many NorCal um, criteriums. You come into a corner, and then the finish line is like 150 meters away from there. Yeah. And what I always tell myself and I tell my teammates and anybody who wants to work on their sprint is like sprint for the final corner. Yeah. And even if you're completely gassed and you can't even turn the pedals over anymore, you're probably still going to be like fourth or fifth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because if you're coming first through that last corner, um, there's usually, especially when you're going 38 miles an hour or something, there's usually only one best line through that corner. Yep. And if you're taking it, then you're not going to get passed through the corner. Right. Assuming you can take a good line through the corner and, and maybe close the door on inside or yeah, you can talk more about that later. But, yeah, um, yeah. but, uh, sprint, sprint for the last corner and, and, um, carry as much speed through it as possible and uh, hope there's not a guy like Justin on your wheel. <laughs> I think that doesn't happen a lot in lower level racing. They wait until, or I, uh, wait until it's, you can see the finish and it's a straight I line. Go. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I have to see that banner and hear the, the you probably already hear it. Mm -hmm. So, um, when then would you start sprinting for the last corner? Like how, when do you unload that? Well, in an ideal situation, um, you know, maybe save maybe save a little bit for after last corner but it's really important with uh, with eight seconds to go that you're first yeah not even second first through the last corner um and you know it's like you said a lot of people don't employ this tactic because they think like oh i'm gonna be so gassed i'm gonna get passed by everybody but what what ends up happening is if it's going that fast through the last corner people are going to be dropping wheels it's not going to be all together mm -hmm. there's going to be gaps opening up and maybe the premier sprinter who has more power than you, maybe you think has better tactics than you, maybe he's caught behind some split or some guy who's taking a bad line through the corner. So much can happen through that last corner in a crit. Mm -hmm. Just go through first, um, pretend like that's the finish line yeah. and see where that gets you. I, yeah. I say, it, we, this happened in our race, we didn't put the video up, but Jonathan was pulling so hard that he did put splits in the field. And I feel like then when I attacked, I was really racing against three people. 
like everyone else was so far back that the, they're no longer in the race yeah, because yeah. of what you did. So they're kind of the same thing you're explaining, right? Yeah. You yeah. sprint into it. Yeah. Um, what kind of coming in before that, how far back would you want to start that sprint? Like uh, position wise? Well, if it's being let out, which in lower categories, it's probably not being let out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then it might be a good idea uh, to to start from like 10 wheels back. And I talk about this like this like slingshot effect you can get in group rides yeah. and try this. This is this is so much fun because you come from like 10 or 12 wheels back and you start your acceleration there because if you do it from like second wheel, you're not going to be able to get separation. Yeah. Right. Bike racing is so much about ex- about acceleration. And if you're if you're coming past the front rider with three or four more miles an hour, they're just, they could try, but they're just not going to get in your draft. No, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, if it's not being let out, come from, from 10 or 12 wheels back, um, from maybe 250 meters from that last corner. And, uh, you're going to surprise everybody on the front who is kind of waiting for the sprint to, to open up, maybe saving their legs. And you might have somebody who was on your wheel. If they're smart, they're going to be doing the same thing as you. And they're going to be your main competition. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's being let out, you need to be, uh, the person in front of you is sacrificing themselves. Yeah. So you you need to be, you know, um, third, third, fourth wheel, depending on, on how fast it's going. What if you don't have a lead out man? Um, yeah, it can get scrappy in the last, <laughs> yeah. uh, last, last lap of a, uh, criterium. Um, you have to recognize who the fast guys are and you have to, um, make sure that you're not going to fall victim to this, this slingshot attack in the last moment, because I've lost plenty of races from people doing exactly that coming, coming past me when I'm, too far too far forward because too far back is what people often talk about as bad position yeah. too far forward is equally as bad at times right yeah absolutely well let's talk about the mechanics of a sprint uh you mentioned the fact that you're lighter than uh than most sprinters but you're heavier than most climbers how tall are you give us an idea of your build and then we'll go into kind of like that how you actually sprint yeah um so uh, i'm like six foot okay something like that maybe a half an inch six foot and a half an inch um i weigh like a low 160s okay and um I've just, I'm like physiologically, we've, we talked about this earlier. We touched yeah. on some people are built better for one thing than another. Um, and I'm kind of lanky. Yeah. So yeah. everyone, and I was told when I was coming up too, like, oh, you must be a good climber. And I thought, well, maybe I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I am like all fast twitch. Like right. I have worked really hard over the last 10 years. I never practice my sprint. That's another thing people ask me all the time. Yeah. How do you practice your sprint? It's like, well, I go out and do group rides and yeah, um, sprint there. Sprint there. Yeah. But I don't go out by myself and open up sprints. I never do that. I always, I'm always working on zone four or less aerobic capacity because that's my, that's my weakness. Yeah. 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 Okay. You need to make it to the sprint. Exactly. Yeah. And for yeah. the longest time, uh, I mean, I wish somebody told me that because for the longest time, even after I realized, okay, I'm a sprinter. So I better, I better work on that and that alone. But it's yeah. like, sure. I could sprint from 12th to eighth. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of cool. But like, I was never in that sweet spot where like, I'm actually going for the win. Um, yeah. to Jeff. So, uh, metric people, you're 183 centimeters and you're 62 and a half kilos or 72 and a half. So, I wish that would be <laughs> weird. Maybe awesome. I am a climber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the mechanics of a sprint, some, we see like a Caleb Ewan position. That's like crazy over the front. Then you see somebody that's more like Marcel Kittle, where he's like all pretty upright really yeah. uh, for, even though he's a big guy. Do you, are you the type of person that really tries to get aero when you sprint and get low with your body or do you just try, just focus on putting out as much power as possible? Um, Pete talked about this. I, I, yeah. I, I've watched this video on your guys' channel. Yeah. Um, you get this, this power position where your elbows are kind of out yeah. and, I, and I do, I do pull in, like you're pulling really hard. You're using your whole body, right? Yeah. Because at the end of a crit, your, your legs aren't what they were at the beginning of a crit. So, yeah, yeah. so you want to utilize, it's a whole body effort and you're rocking your bike. Yep. And, um, and part of that, yeah, is, is like my arms are at 90 degree. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm pulling myself close to the stem. Yeah. So adopting that, that position is kind of an arrow position, but I'm not consciously thinking about like kissing the stem like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like Caleb Ewan does. Yeah. Because then you sacrifice power. Right. It's all about speed, right? Because yeah. even if you can do 2,000 watts all upright, you might be better off doing 1,000 watts, but in an arrow position. Right. So you have to think about it like that, too. Do you, are you the sort of person that likes to sprint from a lower cadence, like lower cadence, higher, higher force, and then build up? Or do you find yourself spinning faster, perhaps, than other, than other sprinters? I hardly ever shift in a sprint. Um, so I think I start a little bit lower than I like, and I finish a little bit higher, but I think that whole range is probably on the lower end. I I've heard of some other sprinters and and especially track guys really spinning it up. And like, 
115, 120 is R RPM cadence is about where I finish, I think, looking at the data files after. And that would be on the on the really fast end. Yeah, me. you start low. And start 95, way, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Now, is that out. because you're in a P12 race and it's already going super fast? Because I think the lower level, when people start sprinting, I, sprint, I shift like two times or three times. <laughs> so there is a thing that happens. And it's kind of interesting. So I made a post on your guys' forum about mm, this. I saw this. Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, and I wasn't planning on the post getting so long, um, yeah. but, uh, but I started thinking about it because there's this question about cadence and, or I think it started by, do you shift during your sprint? Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I started thinking about gear ratios and why I never sprint. And I think a lot of it has to do with when you're le when you're being let out, when the pace is really fast, say in a P12 crit, yeah. um, when you start your sprint and when you finish your sprint, you're only maybe going like three or four miles an hour faster. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a cat five race or if you're in a breakaway or there's a lot of other situations, if you're starting your sprint from a much, much lower speed, you're going to have to to shift through. Otherwise, you're going to just spin it up to 150 or something, which yeah. is not efficient. Right. Yeah. You have to kind of find that balance. Yeah. Then I think that's why a lot of sprinters actually favor running a larger chain ring when you have like, and sorry, this is just a little aside, but when you're down lower on that corn cob of your cassette and those jumps are bigger between the gears, right? So if you can have a bigger chain ring, then you reside slightly higher up that cassette and then you then don't have to shift quite as much. This is all I need to do. So <laughs> get a bigger chain 56. ring. 56. Be a good sprinter. That's Greater the only thing line. you've yeah. been lacking, Nate. It's just a 56. Thanks. That's it. <laughs> um, so what if you do have to shift? How do you do that? Because I think you said in some of your videos that you sit down when you shift. I, I have. Those are on like longer sprints. Um, you don't necessarily have to. There's kind of a dead spot when you're at like 12, when you're at a 12 and six, I guess, mm -hmm. where you're not, there's not so much power. Yeah. If you think of a clock, mm -hmm. yeah. three, uh, three and nine, you're putting out the most power, right? Yeah. You're, st you're stomping on the pedal. That would be an inopportune time to shift. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it could be a disaster. Like you could crash from it. Um, right. Uh, and especially if you have a worn chain or something, but, um, but the best spot is that dead spot and you just have to time it. I think it's, it's not something that I've ever practiced. Um, I don't think it's something that anybody ever practices, but just feeling where that dead spot is and yeah. knowing when to shift. Yeah. Um, sitting down if you have to. I've never even thought of that. Really? I just, yeah, I just click it if I need it. I feel like another thing too that's subconscious is you ease off on the power slightly. A little bit, yeah. You it's, it's ever so slight. It's like not intentional. Not like I'm gonna ease up now and shift, but it's like subconscious, it happens because you don't wanna be jamming as hard as you can just in case it doesn't grab when you think it does. I've noticed that. I look at my sprint, my sprint power files after the race and it's like, oh, I had a little dip. Yeah. Oh, that, well, that's what, and I can look at the cadence, I could figure out that's when I was shifting. So yeah, yeah it's a good observation. Almost right? like a clutch in a car, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you kind of engage the clutch a little bit to drop that power down, or I should say the power delivery in that case. but. Um, the, the shifting side of things is interesting, especially when you get on the climbs, like that's one spot where in many cases you'll have to decide, do I start with an extra low cadence or do I shift on the climb? Because when you get on a climb, then it gets even tougher. A lot of the For time sprinting up a climb. Yeah. When you're sprinting up a yeah. climb and grabbing a gear, when you're climbing up something like that, that's like extremely hard. I'm sure you face that even like I watched the Santa Cruz race, that sort of yeah. thing where you're sprinting up like that. How do you manage those situations? So that Santa Cruz sprint is kind of unique because it's so long. Yeah. Um, the sprint almost starts at the bottom of that hill, but yeah. it's like 25 seconds or 30 seconds or something from the bottom of that hill to the line. It's long. <laughs> so there is sitting down and shifting and I'm not doing huge enough watts at that point to where I'm worried about yeah. About, um, you know, having a bad shift or something. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but for something, yeah, like the bump maybe, mm -hmm. or something where you're, you're sprinting into a, a, a climb. Yeah. You can just, you have the convenience of just put it into the gear that you want the, into the, the cadence that you want the most. Yeah. And then if you're sprinting, you can pretty much just put more power out, but maintain that same. Yeah. So if yeah. you're like a hundred, do a hundred. And then when you start the climb and you stand up for your sprint, you yeah. just keep pushing a hundred, but you're going up a climb. Right. Right. Kind of convenient. Yeah. Kind of keep it there. Yeah. Do you know before, when you come to a race, do you know when you're going to go for the sprint or how do you, Oh yeah. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you figure that out? Oh, um, so do a lap on the course before you, before you race. Like yeah. I totally intend on doing that tomorrow. I'm racing the circuit race tomorrow. Probably going to get dropped, but <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, uh, come out, do a lap if you can. Um, I've, I've gone on like Google earth and like really dorked out on like the, the numbers. Like, yeah. How many meters is it from this last corner? And do that if you're worried you're not going to be able to do a lap or both is yeah, better. But yeah, um, yeah. but definitely have a spot picked out, even if it's a mailbox or something like here's where I'm going to sprint um, and start to visualize. You know, I think this crosses like other sports, but visualize yeah. how it's going to happen. And um, and with a lot of experience, oftentimes 
you know, you'll see that situation. It'll be the last lap. Oh, I, I've thought about this, you know, yeah. and this is exactly how it's going to go down. Are you then, so how do you balance that with reacting to the race? Like, um, are you the first person to go then? Are you hoping that you get on the right wheel at that time? Or what if someone sprints early? Sure. Yeah. I mean, y- you have to, you have to react to what's going on in the race. Yeah. Um, you can't tell everyone, Hey guys, it's not time. Yet. This isn't, this isn't part of my plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, bike racing, it doesn't often go the way you want it to, um, get a better feel. Um, look at who started the race and you get a better feel for how it's going to go. But, but definitely have an idea of like, well, in this situation, I might do this, but, um, you know, ra- racing strategy is a fickle thing. And I talk about it a lot, a lot on my channel. It's, it's 50 little decisions or hundred little decisions in a 60 minute crit that each one has these huge implications that could potentially make or break you at the end of the race. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of them come down to the last lap too. Do I go left or do I go right? Do I follow this guy? So you definitely have to react to things. Um, to, to keep it in your favor. One um, tip on that too is I watch some of your videos and other videos on YouTube where I time the sprint. So I, I look at different categories and I look back to see how long it takes. Cause I never think of it in meters. I think of it in time. Yeah. Um, so I, I look back and be like, okay, they went from here and that's 10 seconds or this corner is like, yeah. like 10 seconds. So if I go in 15 seconds or 20 seconds land park, that's what we chose yeah. of when to attack. I was like, Oh, a minute, a minute I think is perfect. Which brings me to my next question is, what do you do when somebody goes like one minute out and you're a sprinter? Yeah, like, they put you in that sprinter's dilemma, so to speak. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, well, first it depends who it is because um, knowing your competition's huge. Um, I understand that's hard for some of the lower categories. If you're new to racing, you don't know who's who. Yeah. Um, P12 in particular, you start to recognize like, if this guy goes at one minute out, then I, I have to follow him or I have to have somebody else. If somebody else doesn't follow him, it has to be me. Cause you mm-hmm. just can't let him get away. Right. Brian Larson's one of those guys. I recently did, um, commentary with him. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, um, <laughs> be, be ready to chase. If you have to, if somebody goes from one minute out in this specific example, um, if it's a guy you're not worried about, um, then, then let him go and, and, uh, so he'll you'll, probably burn himself up. You'll pull an audible in that case, and you'll be like, "Look, I would love to sprint in a different scenario, but I'm going to latch onto this guy because he, I have to mark him." Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. There's situations where, like um, the aforementioned Larson, if he goes, um, I might have to. If, and if nobody follows, I might have to use my sprint to get to him because it's like I would rather die trying. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Then, uh, yeah. So then miss out on the chance. And he's my and he's my friend of me, so I have to. Yeah, chase Brian one has to. Yeah. So how long do you wait? Right, because the longer you wait the more likely you can then get on someone else's wheel. As, I feel like in this situation, as a person who likes to go from, from one minute, is if, uh, if, if someone else goes and you wait that extra half second, you're probably going to win then, right? If you can get on that person's wheel. And they, and they pull you up. Yeah, they, right? if they notice you're there, they probably will stop riding. But, oh, really? But yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. That's what I would do, right? And it's even better than for the one minute person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so. Yeah. And how long do you wait before you try to jump on? Or is it just like you see the kit and you've been racing so long, you know, it's Brian and you jump right away. Yeah. It's just, it's depends so much on the circumstances because, um, I would, uh, if he comes flying past me, um, with a minute left in the race, um, I'm probably, it's probably too late for me anyway. It's probably already over because I'm, I've put myself in a position um, where I'm too far up to the front and the pace isn't fast enough. Because like we talked about before, if the pace isn't very fast, you don't want to be second wheel because when things slow down, attacks fly. When things speed up, everyone is happy and they're all at single file and everyone wants to stay in draft. So if, if I'm like second wheel or third wheel or something like that and Brian comes flying past me, then the pace isn't fast enough. I shouldn't have been in that position. Yeah, The race is pretty much over. And I can chase him down and, and maybe maybe catch him and somebody else can win or something like that. Right. But Um, I'm hoping that somebody else chases. So in the lower categories, you think it's, it's more likely that that strategy would work of, because the pace isn't super high. Yes. And people would be much less inclined to chase it down because everyone at that point is like, everyone thinks they're a sprinter, like we said, right? So everyone sees that attack go and it's like, oh, I'm saving my legs for the last 200 meters, but they don't realize the the race is, is going away. Yeah. And it doesn't take much. Two, yeah. two seconds of indecision and and it's and it's, it's over. Gone. Yeah. yeah, the differential in speed's too much, and you can't close that gap. I you mentioned, and this is on the assumption that you do know the racers yeah. that you're racing with. If you don't know the racers that you're racing with, is it just a simple scenario of you just have to rely on your strengths and try to exploit them? How do you do that? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, if you don't know, um, you can roll the dice. I mean, it's yeah, it's yeah. a it's a hard decision to make, but she, it has to be a snap decision. So if I um, if I see Nate come flying past me and I've never met Nate, Nate before, um, I could take a look at him if he's if he's coming around with with purpose. I have to make a decision. I can't hesitate. If I'm going to chase, it has to be that that instant. Because yeah, if yeah. you wait two seconds, then you're going to kill yourself to close yeah. that gap down. If even if you can. Let's say it another way. If you wait two seconds, it's kind of pointless to chase. Yeah, but everyone starts thinking that. So that's yeah. why that's, that's why, why that move, move right? that's why that move is really yeah. strong. And for for you non sprinters might be listening to this, sprinters hate. I hate when people do that because oh, it's yeah. like I'm looking for my teammates every time somebody yeah, yeah. Does somebody's that latching onto yeah. that. Right? I'm looking back and I'm like, is, is somebody gonna follow yeah. that? You know? That's a great uh, segue now. So you ride with a team. And what's your team name? Tayrun. Tayrun. So Tayrun Elite. With Tayrun Elite, uh, you I think you ride sometimes with a full team of eight y- people. Yeah. So do you have then teammates? Because you're the sprinter, right? Yep. Do you have teammates that if something happens in that minute, they just bury themselves to close it to close down that gap? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And then you're going to get on their wheel. Yeah. Or two, two or three wheels, wheels behind yeah. them. Usually you, you try to let it fill out a little bit because yeah. you yes, don't want to accelerate. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And right. then uh, I, I'm guessing, too, is one person responds and everyone just starts filling in behind that. Yeah. Person. And then and then once that that first person responds, then everyone else is like, oh, here's my chance. So now everyone is going to chase that one down. I yeah. find it's. uh do you find, is it harder in the lower categories for people to sacrifice themselves like that? Because I think at the higher levels, I, I asked him, uh, a NorCal racer, uh, uh, you know, how'd you, how'd you do? And he goes, oh, we won, right? I don't yeah. ever hear that in the no. threes or the fours. I don't think they're you like, ever will either. They're like, Steve won. <laughs> um, do you think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to get teammates to sacrifice themselves for that at, at the lower level? At the lower level, for sure. At the higher level, um, it's such a team sport. And, um, and it is a team win. It's, it's hard to, de- to describe because I remember being a cat four, cat five and not really understanding that, yeah. that it's such a team sport at a higher level. Um, and we, I mean, we split all the, all the winnings if there's any prizes or anything like that. We, we all split it because it's, it's a team effort. Like yeah. there, there will be one guy who crosses the line with his hands up, but, um, it was a team effort that, that made that, that up possible. Is part of that, like it gets so competitive and if everyone else working as a team, you cannot win alone. Do you think that's part of it? Yeah, do you think a solo rider can be competitive? Well, tomorrow I'm going to be a solo rider, so hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I well, that's teammates good. tomorrow. Hey, great question. What if you are a solo rider? Yeah. What do you do? So my strategy tomorrow is going to be a lot different than if we came out with eight riders. Yeah. Um, because I'll be by myself. So, uh, yeah, it changes, it changes everything. I mean... Um, we should probably talk about the course really quick. Could I run sure. people through it? Absolutely, so yeah. So can understand. So it's about a six-minute lap. Um, I think that... Uh, I want to say that there's somewhere around like... 400 feet of climbing or no 300 feet of climbing i think in a lap something like that it's a decent amount uh and it has a climb that lasts just under two minutes just right around two minutes uh for your field they're probably right there just under and that's two minutes out of a six minute lap so and that climb goes to 10 percent. so it's a pretty steep one 75 Uh, minutes yep yeah and you'll have a 75 minute race overall i think that we did we did 75 minutes i think that we did 11 laps um somewhere around there yeah so uh and it's laguna seca so if anybody's wondering that's the famous motor uh circuit that you can see on all sorts of different racing or even video games of racing that sort of stuff uh it also tends to have a wind that it comes as a crosswind on the majority of the course except for the finish line sprint section which is really short that tends to have a tailwind um and it's about a hundred meter sprint out of a turn it's very short that is really again. short very short yeah yeah so that's the course so uh what's your strategy going into this knowing that probably going to be some really fast climbers with yes. that hard <laughs> climb and your solo yeah well as a solo rider i mean you you want to be represented in the break um yeah. because if it gets away and it has all the major teams in it that are willing to do the chasing yeah. then your race is over and right. this happens all the time, road races, criterium circuit races, everything where, um, the right mix gets up the road. And if you're not part of it or your team's not part of it, then you either have the obligation to chase yep. <laughs> or you are giving up, you are conceding the win. It's yeah. over because, um, nobody else is going to chase, right? Nobody's going to chase their teammate. Right. So, um, tomorrow, uh, it's just such a hard course. My strategy is just kind of survival. Um, it's, it's, it's out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. A little bit too hard of a, of a course for me. Yeah. Plus, there's going to be really fast guys. They're pro riders. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to get in the breakaway. Um, I'm going to look for opportunities to do that, not on the climb, because I'm going to be trying to do some maybe some sag climbing. I'm going to mm-hmm. be trying to save my legs. Um, there's going to be guys who are 
watt per kg wise way faster than me. Mm-hmm. So um, that's not where I'm going to make things happen. I think I think over the top. Um, I did this race like seven years ago. It's been a long time. Over the top, I remember there being attacks that go that that were successful, got a gap. Then you do this twisty descent, and you can establish a gap there. Mm-hmm. Because um, believe it or not, on on a course like this, being in the breakaway could actually be easier. Yeah. Than yep. being in the field, it keeps the pace higher, more exactly. consistent, less surge. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially for for the, the non climbers like me, because I want just this consistent effort throughout yep. the whole course, up the climb in particular. And if you're in a very dysfunctional p- uh, chase group or a peloton that is hasn't quite decided what's going on yet, there's there's no breakaways yet or anything, you get this weird thing where where it's really slow on the backside of the course. Yeah. This was my race. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking yes. about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It'll be really slow on the backside, and then everyone just goes as hard as they possibly can up the climb because they they realize that hey, drafting isn't as, as important up the climb, and um and I'm a good climber, so I'm gonna go as hard as I possibly can up and over this this climb, and, and that would be the worst for me. Right. That is surgy, and that was gonna that is gonna kill me. Yep. So I want to either get in the break, or I want to um try to make sure that that doesn't happen where it's really surgy. So yeah. if I have to um, put in an effort in a crosswind or something like that, just to keep the pace high, it might be worth my, my while. Yeah. I would think it, it doesn't take a whole lot of laps like that on a course like this to, to discourage those people that were going to, you know, ride their brains out up that climb as hard as they can. It doesn't take a whole lot yeah, to yeah. actually discourage them to do that. All you have to do is make them work hard in the flats in one section and then they don't feel quite as fresh. And if know? there's a crosswind section, if there's one thing climbers hate, it's crosswind. Yes. Yeah. So if there's a crosswind section, I could see myself, you know, guttering things a little bit just to make it make them hurt a little bit before the base of the climb. Yep. To discourage that that 600 700 watt effort up and over the climb jeff what's your uh ftp power to weight and then maybe your like sprint numbers um my uh, so my ftp is uh, about 330 mm-hmm. um and I've, it's taken me a long time it's it's a pretty modest number but it's taken me a long time to get it that high uh and um just tested a couple weeks ago actually nice ramp tests hurt guys nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> one more minute um yeah what was the other uh, my my your peak power numbers peak, uh, peak power numbers um so i'm going to i'm going to tell you what they are at the end of a crit because that's what actually matters right okay <laughs> cuz people can go out and warm up yeah. and then yeah. like do a peak crazy number but at the sure. end of a crit it might be totally different so um if i'm really fit and i'm doing real well and it's like july and i have a target race then um i can peak at like something around 1500 um and then i and then it usually comes down to like the 1200 range for for the duration of the sprint maybe 1100 range for the duration of the sprint that's a big sprint that's that's those are big numbers for people that don't have a point of reference those are very high i think on average you're holding like watching the videos i see around the 1300s for like a very long time like 15 seconds uh i don't think it's that long okay 10 (laughs) seconds sometimes sometimes yeah maybe um maybe i can hold 1300 for yeah maybe eight or ten seconds so you're about 4.4 4.5 watts per kilo but i think your sprint is higher than that yeah Mm -hmm. yeah how much of it do you think is um because you've had great success in northern california is very um competitive how much do you think of it it's your brain and positioning um and your team and part of that like if you didn't success yeah oh it's all about position like you could be mark cavendish and if if you're like 12th wheel through that that final corner like we talked about then it doesn't matter if you put if you're doing 2000 watts Mm. how do you get in position (laughs) have really sharp elbows in the last lap (laughs) no but really so let's say it's like two or three laps to go what are you trying to do um well so if you have teammates who are on board who there's a lead out then you have your teammates lead you out and the whole idea there is um they are sacrificing themselves for your sprint. So uh, you get behind a rider or two or six or however many you possibly can that yeah. are teammates and um, they keep the pace fast enough where you're maintaining your good position in the lead out train and it discourages attacks. So somebody could try the the one minute attack that we talked about, but if your t- teammate's on the front killing himself for for your own sprint success, then they're not gonna get very far. Yeah, and then he peels right. off the next guy go. So it's basically one verse four or something. Yeah. If you're by yourself, it's a lot different. And um, not everyone's good at this. There have been some local NCNCA racers who had a lot of success when I was coming up who were no longer on a premier team that I won't mention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who all of a sudden it was like, where'd he go? You know? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. He's in this race, but he's being dropped. So there's some guys who are very good, have really strong sprints, very good from a lead out when everything is very coordinated. Yeah. But when they're on their lonesome, 
Yeah. Um, it's it's a lot different, and you just have to find. It comes down to um, to really fighting for position, and um, not everyone not everyone has that. There's something that that turns on in your head in the last lap of a crit where where it's like a fight or flight thing where you know you you just you're fighting for position and um, you're recognizing who the strong wheels are. If there's another lead out that's forming, get behind that because you know that's going to mm. be at the front. You know, within a half a lap to go or so. How much of it too is like the the final two laps is it's really it's almost like your fitness for eight minutes or ten minutes because aren't you putting out a lot of power to fight for these wheels and to like do things or how does that work are you trying to stay pretty chill well you want to keep position and stay chill but <laughs> pick one you know? yeah, yeah 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 exactly <laughs> so it's not always easy um, the best sprinters can remain chill and stay in good position because a lot of it is I just identifying those fifty little decisions you make in a crit, you know, a lot of them come down to just identifying, oh, there's a right hander coming up. So I'm going to take the inside line or it's a left to right win. So this is a better, this is a better path to take around this rider. There's so many small decisions like that. And you just, you just can't learn that without being out there and doing hard group rides, practice races. We didn't talk about your, uh, your, we didn't specifically say your YouTube channel's name. Can you say what it is? I did. Yeah. NorCal Cycling. Nor- NorCal Cycling is on YouTube. NorCal Cycling videos. Videos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very so straightforward. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> NorCal Cycling. Yeah. Perfect. It's the best way to do it. So I, I, I think too, the best way to learn this is you have these little like decision points and yeah. you will pause the video and say, see this and this, these people just did a lead out and these people yeah. are fresh. So I'm going to make the decision to go right here instead of left. And then that probably saved you 10 spots yeah that, yeah. Oh, that split second division, yeah. decision so i'd recommend everyone to watch your videos are free awesome. um yeah. and uh then you can kind of understand this because it's hard to we can talk about situations but it's so hard unless you see them yeah it's really hard it's to complex. kind of feel them yeah they're all complex and it becomes like a pattern recognition thing too you know like you'll you'll see this this thing happen like you said and i'll freeze the frame in one of my videos and say this will hit you like a ton of bricks once you've seen it a few times yeah. but for new racers they might decide they might make the wrong decision in this in this given situation. Yeah, and, and so often also just race brain, you know, comes into play. And even though it seems painfully obvious from the outside in or once you watch it on video in the moment. Yeah. You know. All the all the blood is in your sense. legs, not yeah. your head anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, let's say there's a sprint. How do you know when to go around somebody in a sprint? Um so at Santa Cruz, I came around that guy way earlier than I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned it. And the reason I bring this example up is because it's a video I posted recently. Um, Santa Cruz, we talked about a little bit. You come out of this corner, it's off camber. Um, it's a little bit technical, so you have to scrub some speed off and then you immediately get hit with this like 6% climb. Yeah. That's why it's so hard. Not because on paper you look at it and it's like, it's not that hard of a climb. It's because you're coming so slow into the bottom of it. Yeah. And then everyone starts sprinting. And I was like fourth wheel at the bottom of this climb, maybe 300, 400 meters from the, the finish. And um, I decided to come around this rider at the bottom because he was letting a gap open up over this this climb that lasts maybe 200 meters. Mm-hmm. So in that situation, you have to you have to react to that gap opening up. Okay. And mm-hmm. and I made that decision in an instant because if I hesitated for one or two seconds, just like that that one minute attack that comes around you, that might be the end of the race. And it might be it might feel like the right thing to do in the moment because oh I'm getting a draft. And this guy's still going hard. Um, and and if I go around him, I might burn myself up, but the race is getting away. There was two riders in front of him that were maybe three riders in front of him that were getting away. Mm. So when to come around, if there's a gap opening up in front of him, that's one of the most obvious times to come around. Um, when to start your sprint, is that more? No, I'm thinking of, let's say it's, you're going 30, 35 miles per hour and it's on a flat and there's no gap. Someone's ahead of you. When do you choose to like get out of that draft and start start sprinting? Yeah, or you're kind of sprinting behind the person too, yeah. right? For a while. Yeah, yeah. When you tr- when you decide to get out of the draft to try to pass. Them. Oh, um, well, with just enough time to <laughs> you, yeah. where you can confidently come around him at the line. Well, I th- and no wh- sooner. I'm watching a lot of these videos. I think a lot of people, as soon as it starts, they just immediately get out of the draft. Oh, okay. So, like you know what I mean? Like how do yes. you? Because you want to save some of your legs. And- Definitely. Yeah. Don't go too early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's just as bad as going too late. If you go too late, you're going to lose the race. Yeah. yeah. If you go too early, you're going to lose the race. <laughs> but how do you decide when yeah. is the right time? I, how can you tell? So I feel like it comes down to your strengths though too. You know what I mean? Like in the sense that yeah. if, if you, you kind of know when you do best and you estimate how long that takes to the line, that's yeah. when you go for it, right? Yeah. yeah. You know it because you've seen it a hundred times before. Yeah. But, um, but there's one thing that I do 
And it's a little bit of an aside, but I'll tell you because it's an awesome sprinter's trick. I only get to do it like maybe three times a year, but it's one of my favorites because um, if you're worried that you're on the front too soon as a sprinter, um, you, you go maybe 90%. And you wait for that guy behind you to go, oh, he's not going fast enough. Oh. And he comes around you and then you go full gas. Yeah. And then you force him into the wind. Yeah. So um, you can trick people into coming up too soon. And, um, and that's an awesome one. That feels so, that one feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you see, so you would like see the wheel yeah. kind of in the corner of your vision and that's when you would, you would go hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, or when you're sprinting with the position we talked about like this, you can look under your shoulder and you can see what's what's going on. Make sure you're looking forward you, too. You feel but. it too, though. There, there's um, you feel where that person is. It, does, yeah. it isn't entirely based off of vision. You can hear them. Sprinting's loud. Yeah, true. With it's carbon wheels, clanging gears, carbon wheels, fast speed. You can hear hard breathing, that sort of stuff. You can hear when a person is accelerating or close, something yeah. like that. You know, yeah. You can kind of piece it all together from those different spots. But I wish I had, I wish I had a, a more concise answer other than. Um, Pick that spot out. Uh, it comes back to what we said earlier too: is, um, is is picking out spots on the course where you have kind of benchmarks. Where this is where I can go full gas, um, and I can hold it to the line. So you might stay behind somebody, oh, and, if, and if just yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. If they're if they're going really hard, <laughs> and you're on their and you're on their wheel, and you think they're going way too soon, and they're going to burn up, absolutely stay in their draft. Make sure that you that you're not going to get swarmed because one one thing that can happen is if there's a sprinter in front of you who's gone too early or lead out guy, um, you you can get swarmed and riders can come to your left and right and you can get boxed in effectively by your own lead out and that's another thing that um, position wise that you can do to to edge out another sprinter is yeah. is um is box them in. Yeah, that, that just, that's all that's all it takes too. Like, yeah. uh, and that's like one of the best ways of neutralizing a person, really. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah um, you know? My my last video, I did an analysis with uh, Chris Reichert. Yeah. And he talked about he won the green jersey at Chico, which is an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. And he talked um, about employing some of these tactics in his sprints, and um, he does it so effectively. There was one sprint, um, P one two sprint, he did. It. And he, and he won, this is Chico, crit, huge race. Yeah. And he was doing like 800, 900 watts, which, which isn't that much for a P12. Right. So it's a lot, but yeah, it's like, yeah. he won a sprint in a P12 race, yeah. doing like 800, 900 watts because he, he took the inside lane and then he, he pushed it wide and he prevented somebody from taking that lane. Yep. So they would have to slow down to come around him because yeah. the, otherwise they hit barriers. And it's important to differentiate between swerving into a person and then just staying on your line and your line ends up coming across. Yes. Right. Yes. Because that's the, I think a lot of people see any sort of deviation other than perfectly straight. And I see a lot of people cry foul on that. And it's not necessarily foul to do that. Uh, where it is fouls and you deviate rapidly or suddenly from that line for no reason exactly yeah yeah so, for a specific reason <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah the reason is the illegal part yeah, yeah. Exactly. so if your reason is you're taking a a, a perfect ideal line through a corner mm -hmm. and nobody can come around you until you've exited the corner because the speed is so fast and that you just that just means you took a great corner right but to like intentionally get in somebody's way is very illegal and very dangerous yeah yeah, yeah. so what's the uh i have two last questions what's the thing you hate as a sprinter like the thing you, hate, like like, thing you hate to see at the end. the rider do your no no like or? um just throughout the race yeah like to 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 beat you kind of both questions what do you hate and what would beat you okay being a sprinter yeah yeah um so this well, is one lap to go yeah go I have strong scenario. teammates this doesn't happen very often but the one thing that drives me absolutely crazy is when a breakaway gets away with all the other teams except yours. Yeah, and I'm looking around, going like, "Where, where are you guys? We're we're really good at this. We're basically in every single move up the road." But as a sprinter, that's the last thing you want to see. Is like, "Okay, cool. I guess we have to chase now." Yeah, you know. And now, say it's Mike's bikes up the road or somebody. The, your yeah. competition's up the road. Yeah, and their sprinter is now sitting back, going, "Oh, this is great. Now Taryn's going to chase for me, and uh, and their sprinter's going to get tired." Yeah. So uh, another question on that, and people, uh, when you when you do your races with Taryn. Um, I think you have, I, you guys talk about a certain amount of riders are designated to try to be in the breakaway yeah. and then you're, you just sit in the pack the whole time and wait. Yeah. Right. Is that right? Well, yeah. Um, I try to get in breakaways. Um, I think most of the races I won last year were out of breakaways. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just looking for, for a, um, an easy way to get in a breakaway. I won't, it's very, very rare that I'll be initiating a breakaway. But if somebody goes in front of you, you always say this, if someone sure. goes, you got to go. Just go. Yeah. yeah. Because, because you're doing way less work than they are and they're putting you in this ideal position up the road 
And um, if you get up there and you realize, oh, this is dysfunctional, it's not going to work, then then sit up and, and well, don't sit up, but just sit on the back of it and basically sabotage it because they're not going to just tell you to the line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It'd be stupid to tell you to the line. Right. And then uh, my last question is, what's the best way to beat you specifically in a sprint at the end? <laughs> in a sprint? Um, well, there's plenty of guys who have way, way more power than me, um, both from a very short distance, like the aforementioned Justin Polson. Um, he's very threatening within, you know, 100 meters if he's on your wheel. Um, you're in a lot of trouble. It doesn't matter yeah. who you are. Um, and also from, from 1K out, guys like you that have your power profile, guys like Brian Larson, um, look out for them. I always look out for those, those really late race attacks. And that's why having a team is, is really great too yeah. because the, all the pressure of keeping the pace really fast, which is great for a sprinter, it's yeah. counterintuitive, right? right? A lot of people don't realize that, but you want it to be really fast in the last lap. Yep. Um, assuming you're in good position, which as a sprinter, you sh- need to be in good position yeah. um, because it discourages those late race attacks, which, which drive me, that's the other thing I was gonna say, what drive me absolutely crazy are those late race attacks. And it's like, I look around and that hesitation can be the end of, end of the race. Yeah, I like it. So it's either go really, it's pretty much the opposite of your strength. Your strength is around 15 seconds. So really short or really long. Yeah. Is the, it's tough, makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And, if, and if I start my sprint from 15 seconds and there's a guy like uh, who can beat me in the last 50 meters behind me, then I'm gonna try to do that rope a dope move and let them come out in the wind. Um, or I'm probably gonna get beat in the last 50 meters. I have to think of something on the fly. Yeah. One final question. If you are in a race and you are the marked sprinter, I'm sure you've experienced this before, and everybody is marking you and waiting for you to really, you know, make the move. Yeah. Or is there anything that you do to try to shift, to kind of like reset the table there? I am this year, um, this year I'm much less inclined to ride hard in a breakaway. Yeah. Because um, I had some wins last year and yeah. a lot of people will will do this thing and it's smart. Like I would do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where uh, they will ride a breakaway with you and everyone's happy and everything's hunky dory. And then you get about, 30 second gap and you've committed some energy and time to this and then yeah. they go oh, okay I'm not going to work anymore. Yeah. Jeff you can k- continue working and it's like oh man. Yeah. And it's smart. Like I would do the same thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um and you started a YouTube channel so that kind of makes you be yeah. marked too. So. Yeah, I understood that might have happened. Yeah. So right. in that situation that's because they they don't want you to beat them in the sprint. Yeah. So they're saying you're the best spinner you should you should be pushing us to the line. Yeah. Yeah, so, or they'll attack me or something yeah. like that. But they 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 don't want to keep bring your line yeah. so how do you respond do you work or do you just sit up and you're willing to take that yeah, gamble you have two things to do um you you know you can either uh you can either attack it and hopefully hopefully there's a reshuffle yeah or um that's if you're feeling especially good yeah yeah <laughs> or you everyone just sits up and yeah. i kind of get de- dejected and just look around and say okay well i guess that's over you know because yeah. if you sit up uh, at least everybody else is sitting up too and, and i'm only going to sit up um if they start, if to they sit do, up. like, it. I, yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. not going to tow them. Just like they're not going to tow me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, breakaways have everyone has to be working. Yeah, it's like maybe once a season where you are able to get into a breakaway and just sit on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, perfect. Thanks, man. Yeah, really appreciate this. Um, thanks for coming on. For everybody that that that's listening to this, that listens to our podcast, you should absolutely check out his YouTube channel. It's awesome. NorCal Cycling Videos. They're they're great. Uh, you have, uh, I, I've learned so much from, from watching those videos. Uh, they're fantastic. So, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure we're going to see you at, at a bunch of other races throughout the rest of the year. Uh, if you have questions, uh, in this case for Jeff, you can go into forum.trainerroad.com and we'll have a, a thread on there specifically for this episode. Uh, Jeff's on the forum too. So you can at Jeff and then you can, uh, I should say you're NorCal cycling on there. NorCal right? cycling, NorCal underscore cycling, I think on there. Yeah. yeah. So you can at NorCal underscore cycling and then you can get get Jeff uh, involved in there if you have any questions as well. Uh, if you're curious about anything that we do uh, here at Trainer Road, just go to trainerroad.com. We'd appreciate that. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you all next time. See ya. Bye-bye. See ya.